Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, if you weren't here last week, I preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I entitled my message, How To and Why. How to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and why we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I want to continue with that message today. If, you, if, if you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> and, and maybe there's some things about it you don't understand, maybe there's some things about it that you have uh, uh, issues with, uh, <clears throat> understanding uh, the scriptural meaning of that, <clears throat> I urge you to get the CD last week. I think they're 2 or $3 a piece. I don't, know what, I don't even know what we're getting for them. Uh, if you can't afford to pay that, we'll give it to you. But I want you to understand why we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, why it is important. And I want you to understand how to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I think that last week's message, not because I preached it, but because the Lord really poured it out last week, I think might help you open up your eyes and your understanding a little better on, on how to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and why it is significant that you do because when you look at how to be baptized then you also look at the same time on why the why explains the how to and the how to explains the why if that makes sense to you and uh and i covered several things last week and i want to continue this morning i want you to go to ephesians chapter 5 ephesians chapter 5 this morning and i want to start off uh, uh reading scripture this morning i want you to listen very carefully to what Ephesians 5 has to say here. Verse 8. If you there, say amen. amen. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Talking to those here who have given their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. People do not understand that if you're not a born-again believer, that you're walking in darkness, that the darkness hides from you the truth of the things of God. It conceals from you what it means to live for God. That's why when a person is not saved, they have not no, no or little interest in the things of God. Because they're living in darkness in a spiritual sense. Their they're, they're eyes of their understanding. When you're in the dark, you can't see anything. Just get up in the middle of the night and try to go through your house without the lights on. If it's anything like our house, uh, uh, it's dark. And it's very easy to stub your toes. It's very easy to stumble over something. Although you've been through that house a thousand times, you still have trouble getting around in that house because it's dark in there. You can't see what you need to see. And when a person does not have Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior in their life, they can't see what they need to see. They can't comprehend it. Uh, the preacher gets up and, and talks about the end times, it's, it's foolishness unto you. The Bible says that the preaching of the gospel is foolishness unto the lost. It's a waste of time to them. It's a waste of time to, to hear some preacher talking about something that somehow or another just does not resonate in your spirit. That's because you're in darkness. That's because that you cannot see the obvious. What is obvious to a believer is not obvious to a non-believer. You can't see it because... You're seeing in the darkness. You're, you're stumbling around through this life in darkness. And the light of truth. Truth always is associated with light, and light is always associated with truth. When you turn the light on, suddenly you begin to see things that you never saw before. Your spirit man comes alive whenever you get saved. When you, when you get saved, the Bible indicates to us that the Spirit of God takes up permanent residence within us. But we believe here at Crossway Church in a second act separate from salvation. Doesn't mean you're not saved. Doesn't mean you aren't as good a Christian as anybody else. 
And we talked last week about why it's important for this second experience, this experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, why it's so important to believers. And I, and, and I truly believe, and it has truly been my desire that every person in this church not only understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but be filled with the Spirit of God so that that light can continue to operate within. Verse 9, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is, the accept, what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. When you turn the light on, it exposes that that is in darkness. You can't take darkness and take it into a room and darken the room. You can't do it. It's impossible. But you can take light with you. Light can go where you go. And when you go into a dark room, you can expose everything in that room. And what takes place when we get saved and when we get filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that light lightens the darkness of our heart. It begins to illuminate to us the things of God. It opens up the eyes of your understanding, in other words. Suddenly, the things that were not important to you prior to salvation suddenly become important. And I tell people this all the time, I, and, and I've probably mentioned this in every sermon I've ever preached when I preached a funeral. Because I'm not going to do your funeral without preaching to the people that are there. Because... If you don't want preaching in your funeral, you need to find somebody else to do your funeral. Because a lot of times, that's the only shot you're going to get at some of those folks. So they're not going to darken the door of a church. Why? Because they're in darkness. They're in darkness. They don't, they don't desire the things of God. But every funeral I have ever preached, I tell the people, it does not matter what your life is about. It does not matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter how much, how famous you are. This lady Gaga that we were talking about the other day. Someday her soul will be required of her. Now I'm not going to stand up here and judge the lady, but it does not take a theologian to figure out that this woman has got some serious spiritual issues. I mean, there was people got mad tore up the little cards and threw them in her face at the outreach because we had the audacity to talk about Lady Gaga. It doesn't matter how famous she is. When she dies, that's not going to get her in heaven. When you die, that's not going to get you into heaven. When we die, there's only one thing that's going to make any difference. And that's whether or not we have the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ alive and well in our life. Other than that, nothing else is going to matter. It's not going to matter how many relatives you got. It's not going to matter how famous you are. It's not going to matter how much money you got in the bank. It's not going to matter what all good things you've done in this life. You can be the best person that ever walked the face of the earth. But if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell. Oh, people don't like it when you preach like that. They don't like it when you tell them, oh, you do this, you're going to go to hell. Oh, you're judging me. No, I don't judge anybody. I'm not judging Lady Gaga. I can't judge her because I can't pass judgment on her. In order to judge someone, you have to be able to pass judgment upon them. I can't condemn her to hell. She's going to either condemn herself to hell or she's going to find Jesus and go to heaven. That's the only alternative. There's nothing in the middle. There's no, there's no qualifiers in the middle. Well, you're talking about her. I'm a good person. Being a good person is not going to get you to heaven. And if you think that, then you're thinking as if you're walking in darkness. 
because that's a lie from the pits of hell, and it will send more people to hell probably than anything else. Well, I'm a good person. So based on the idea that I'm a good person, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm not going to get to heaven. As a believer, I will not make it to heaven because I graded out as a good Christian. I had more good than I had bad. I'm going to make it to heaven based on one thing and one thing alone, and that is faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That sacrificial work of Jesus Christ, me putting my faith in that and that alone. And that's what's going to get us to heaven. And the salvation experience is the only requirement for being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm trying not to get off the subject here, but I felt like I needed to go there this morning. I want you to understand salvation comes first. I've seen people get saved and feel filled with the Holy Spirit at the same time. But you have to be saved in order to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way it'll work whether it's moments before or, or, or years before. Verse 13, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. In other words, all these works of the darkness are exposed by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. In other words, you're dead in your sins. Darkness and death go hand in hand. Verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unto wise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. All right, that's a very important scripture. Verse 17, wherefore, be ye not unwise, don't be in darkness, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. What is God's will? Next verse tells you. And be not drunk with wine. Now, a lot of people think this is just a verse of Scripture talking about talking against drinking. And, and I truly believe that you shouldn't drink. I believe it's a sin for you to drink. Now, we won't debate that today because that's not what I'm preaching on. But that's not what's meant here. That's not the essence of this verse of Scripture. It says what it says and it means what it means, but that's not what's getting at here. And be not drunk with wine wherein is the excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Yeah. In the Greek there, it, it, it is saying, be being filled. Yeah. Last week we had about, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 people came and got refilled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's obeying that command there. Be being filled means you continue to be refilled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. doesn't mean you've lost it. It just means that you need to continue to be filled. Now, you go back to what it says about being drunk with wine. Why is that in the same verse of Scripture? That's a very good question, and I'm going to answer that this morning. Ain't you lucky? Be not drunk with wine. What, what, what takes place when you're drunk? Anybody in there, don't raise your hands, but anybody in here ever been drunk? They were in the house when I was going to Preacher had to raise his hand. I've been there. And I know what I've dealt with drunks most of my adult life. And what takes place is as they consume alcohol, as you consume wine, wine is about, I think, seven or eight percent alcohol. As you consume that, you that word fill there in the Greek, one of the meanings of it is influenced. You've heard the expression, driving under the influence. You're driving under the influence of alcohol. You know, you low riding and all that, you know. You're under the influence. How many people have you seen who would be normal as they began to drink? And the more they drank, the louder they got. The more they drank, the bolder they got. The more they drank, the tougher they got. Ran into a few of those. I mean, you had enough drink, you think you can whip anybody. I, the best way I know of to get a good whipping is to get drunk first and think you can whip anybody and everybody and then meet the guy that you can't whip. 
And he comes in and cleans your clock. Now, to you, you could whip him. Why? Because you're under the influence of alcohol. You have drank in excess, and you're now under the influence of that, and it influences your behavior. It influences what you say. It influences what you do. You can go to drugs. It's the same issue. Drugs influence people to do things that they would not normally do. I mean, you can take a very shy person, someone who, who's just very withdrawn, put a six-pack of Coors in him, suddenly he knows everything, has done everything, can do anything. Why? Because he's influenced by, I, I don't know what it is, there's, there's something that takes place in the chemical process of the brain that, that makes these people do things, brings about this change of behavior in them through the influence of alcohol. It does something chemically in the brain. I can tell you that much. There's a, there's a chemical reaction to that physical consumption of that liquid. I mean, I, I, I've dealt with them. In law enforcement, I've dealt with them day in and day out. You can't reason with someone who's under the influence. Reason does not enter into the equation. If I've had one drunk tell me, I've had a thousand of them tell me. Let me tell you something, Oscar. <laughs> you let me tell you something right now. And they just go on and on and on and on and on. And you try, you try to deal with it in a, in a manner where, where everything will go smooth and everything will go right. And there's no, there's no logic to it. That's what he's mean here when he says, be not drunk, be not drunk with excess of wine. Don't be influenced by what you drink. But be being filled, filled meaning influenced, be influenced by the Spirit of God. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're being influenced. You, you will then have the Spirit of God operating in you in a manner that will influence you in all that you do. I've preached it for years and years and years and years that one of the problems with the Pentecostal church is that we equate the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit with nothing but bizarre behavior. Maybe they get that from this verse of Scripture. Thinking, okay, I'm filled with the Spirit of God. I'm supposed to act like I'm drunk. I've seen people, what, what they call drunk in the Spirit. I've seen that. Where they're just so overwhelmed through the love and the power of the Spirit of God that they're just almost uncontrollable. They're not drunk in the sense that, that they become aggressive or that they become uh, 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 negative. They're drunk in the sense that they're overwhelmed by the experience by the presence of God. Now, now non-Pentecostals really have a problem with that. They cannot understand how anybody could be at that point, and, and, and they almost scoff and laugh at that. But I can tell you this, if you were standing in the presence of the Almighty God, you think you're going to stand there with your hands in your pocket? going, hey, that's God. Man, I'm, I'm standing here looking at Jesus. You're going to be so overwhelmed with his presence. You're going to be so overwhelmed with who he is and how holy he is and, and how glorious and magnificent he is that you're going, to have, you're going to have some influence from that presence of God himself. And that's what takes place when a person is baptized in the Holy Spirit. They're overcome with the presence of God. They're overcome. They're, they're, they're influenced to a level by the Spirit of God. I'll give you an example. If, if you're overwhelmed with sorrow, you're what? You're, you are influenced by that sorrow. Point being, you, you get up. 
you, you have a, a sad situation in your life, something bad happens. Somebody scratches your brand new car or something. That, that influences you to be sad. Sad events influence you to be sad, don't they? Angering events influence you to be angry. Things that happen that you don't like, people scratch your car on purpose, that makes you angry. Now you're no longer sad because you have a scratch on your car. You're angry because somebody did it and they did it on purpose because they don't like your look. And so you're influenced now by that anger. The first time I ever laid eyes on the little woman here, I was influenced by her presence. I was. I was doing one of those. She looked at me and smiled at me, and I'm going, who's she smiling at? I realized I was sitting against the wall with nobody between her and me, but, you know, I thought she's either smiling at me or she's smiling at this wall, and I don't think that wall is good looking as I am. I was influenced by that. And as I got to know her, as we began to fall in love, as we began to have a relationship, I have been influenced by that ever since. For the 25 years that we've been together, I've been influenced by her presence. I'm influenced by her kindness and her, her love for me and all the things that, uh, that I love about her. I'm influenced by that. Hopefully, she's influenced by how I feel about her. That's why people who care about one another, that's why they do things for each other. They're influenced by their love. Do you see how emotions influence you? Anger, uh, joy, something great happens, your team wins a big game. I never will forget Larry Cole rolling around on the, uh, the uh, turf of Texas Stadium when the Cowboys won the Super Bowl. This is a grown man, weighs nearly 300 pounds, and he rolled around like a little baby because they won the Super Bowl. He was, he was influenced by his joy. <laughs> Otherwise, would he have acted so foolishly? Hey, I'm going to get out on the ground and roll around on the ground because I'm happy. He was influenced by what had taken place. So when you, when you go to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's what you want. You want to be influenced by the presence of God. You want to be influenced by the love of God. You want to be influenced by the power of God. All of these things are happening to you as a believer. And they're happening to you by what? By faith. I would not have been influenced by her or her love if I had not cared about her. If she had been nothing to me, it wouldn't have influenced me in the least, or at least not to the degree that it did. And so when we're in the presence of God, when we come forward or when we step forward, we don't have to be done in the church service, but, but, but when you come forward for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're stepping up to be influenced by the Spirit of God. You're stepping up to be filled with an understanding of, of, of everything that Larry Cole felt in, in, in that winning of that ball game. He felt the joy, the exuberance, the, uh, the, the pure pleasure, the, all the frustrations of the past losses that where they had come so close and not yet got there. All of that began to, to enter into the influence that he was under of that joy at that time. Yes. Yes. And all of that constituted and come to like a, like a, like a point of joy. What we have sought, what we have tried to do for all these years has now been completed, and I'm happy about it. I'm happy to the point of exuberance. I'm happy to the point of foolishness. I'm happy to the point of laying on the ground and rolling around like a chicken with his head cut off. I don't care because I'm happy we won the big game. Take that, multiply that by billions, and you'll understand what takes place when a person is baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
We're influenced by everything that we've ever sought, all of that that we've wanted, all of that that we've desired. We want more and more and more of God. We want to reach out and grab Him. We want to be closer than we've ever been before. We want that influence in our life because it's that influence that gives us the power and the desire to serve Him better than we're already serving Him. It's not a point of being a second-class Christian. It's a point of wanting more and more and more. Imagine, if you will, if, if that football team had got to the point, right up to the point where they were about to win the big game, and then they quit. They said, that's it. Let's go home. Everything that they had sought, everything that they desired, they come that close and gave up right before the blessing came. Imagine me in my wife's relationship. We had fallen in love. We decided to get married, and everything went right straight up to the moment uh, of the marriage ceremony, and I just said, oh, got to go. I'm out of time. Bye. And walked out of her life forever, or vice versa. Wouldn't have made any sense, would it? But a lot of times we do that with the Holy Spirit because, you see, as, as you move and you're influenced by joy, whatever it is that brings that joy, you, ha you have to take that extra step, and you have, to, you have to know that it's going to take place. How do you know that it's going to take place? By faith. When a person comes forward, the biggest deterrent to being baptized in the, in, in the Holy Spirit is the lack of faith. Don't mean you don't have faith. Not saying you're not a good Christian. Not saying you're a bad Christian. I'm just saying you've got to have faith. If you receive salvation by faith, I tell people all the time, look, when you got saved, how did you know you were saved? Well, I just knew it. Now you knew it by faith. I mean, you know, there's no magic formula to that. The Bible tells us if we'll confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, but, but there's... There's people who's gotten saved that have not prayed the perfect sinner's prayer. Sinner's prayer is not even in the Word of God, I mean, as far as the, that statement is concerned. No, they go for it to give their heart to the Lord by faith. They know, okay, he died on the cross for me. If I put my faith in what he did on the cross... The Bible says, I will be forgiven. And so you accept that by faith. You do the same thing when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I know it by faith. I'm going to receive it because I know, I, I know that, if, that if I interact with Candace, it, there, it's going to be a good relationship because of the relationship we have. I know by faith most of the things that she's going to do. Why? Because I'm familiar with her. She's familiar with me. We know each other. Well, that's what takes place when you get saved. You know God. You know Him. You're, you're growing closer to Him every day. God is not some mythical being out here that does not exist that is only a, a figment of our imagination. That's not God. I don't care what the atheists say. They can believe, they can choose to not believe all they want to. But me, I'm going to believe because I know, number one, I know what he did in my heart when I got saved. So when I came forward for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and, and by the way, I had, I had a little trouble getting baptized in the Holy Spirit when I first tried. And I'm going to tell you why. I did not understand what I'm trying to explain to you today. There was some confusion in my mind about some things. But I finally went forward one day, and I just thought, Lord, I'm not getting up. I didn't ask nobody to pray for me. We wouldn't preach it on the baptism of the Holy Spirit or anything. I just knew I wanted it. And I came to the altar that day, and I thought, I'm not getting up from here. And do you either convince me that this is not real or you fill me with the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I came away there baptized in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes there has to be a determination. 
we, we, we try and, and for whatever reasons we don't get filled and, and the devil enters in and then doubt enters in. If I'm going to be influenced by Candace's love, I have to believe that she loves me. If the devil comes in to our marriage, and this happens sometimes in the marriages, and begins to put doubt in my mind as to whether or not she loves me or not, then what's going to happen is my influence by her is going to be affected by that, isn't it? She will not be in, able to influence me the way she was before because I doubt her love for me. You can't doubt something and expect to be influenced by it. Use the opposite example, angry. If you didn't know whether or not something made you angry or not, you wouldn't be influenced by it, would you? I mean, if you didn't care if they scratched your car. If it didn't make you angry, you're not going to be influenced by that emotion, are you? If you could care less, if you're the kind of person going, that's okay, I put a scratch on myself yesterday. Then it's not going to matter to you. It's not going to matter whether you uh, uh, had your car scratched or not. There's no influence there because you don't believe that there's anything to that. And that's what takes place a lot of times when we try to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit is we doubt. We doubt we can we doubt we're worthy. We doubt that whatever. We doubt some aspect of the process of that. But you put your faith in the same thing for the baptism of the Holy Spirit as you do for your salvation. There's not, a, there's not some magic formula again. You put your faith in what Christ. You know that what Christ did on that cross is sufficient to save your soul. If it's sufficient to save your soul, then it is most assuredly sufficient to influence you to the point of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the influence of the Spirit of God. You know who God is. You know what He's capable of. You know all that the Bible, well, you might not know all, but you have a good understanding uh, 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 of the fact that God is omniscient, omnipresent, all the supernatural power that God has is available to the believer by the infilling and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now you may be, you may be, come here, Candace. I'm getting saved. She represents the Holy Spirit. She's with me. She's in me. But how influenced am I by her? Now, it might make me want to do good. It might make me want to do right. We know it will. But there's a further level of influence that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our heart and life. Thank you, babe. That takes place when we're baptized. We're being filled with the Spirit of God. If I pour me a glass of water, which I didn't get any today, by the way. Hint, hint. Uh, if I pour me a glass of water, that water has filled up that glass. It's full, isn't it? Then I can take that glass of water to the edge of the pool and jump in over my head. Now what is that glass? Is it still full? It is, isn't it? But it is totally encompassed by the water that is around me. It's now immersed in. Baptized means to be immersed in. It's full. Take the same, same, same thing. I'm, I have this water, and I drink water till I can't drink any more water. I'm full of water now. I slosh when I walk. I'm so full of water. But when I jump into that pool, I'm now immersed in water. That's the, that's the, the, the significance of, of what it means to be saved and to be saved and filled with the Spirit of God. We are totally immersed in the Spirit of God. We're totally immersing our, our desires, our, our thoughts. I mean, we talked last week about all the things that take place, a uh, willingness to be cleansed, and all those other things that the Holy Spirit, like I say, if you didn't get 
here last week, and you can get that CD and listen to it, and it'll tell you what, what some of the things that, that the Spirit of God will do in your heart and life if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. But the whole idea is to be influenced by the Spirit of God. To be filled with the Spirit of God means to be influenced by it. Uh, it goes back to what I heard Brother Swaggart, uh, Donnie Swaggart say one time, and I, and I thought was uh, one of the best things I'd ever heard said about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said, if the baptism of the Holy Spirit is of the devil, why does it make me love God so much? And, and that's a very... That's a very simple statement, but it's so very true. That's what it does. All it's going to do, it, it doesn't mean you're a, uh, you're, you're a better Christian because we're not graded as Christians anyway. In other words, I'm not going to get to heaven because I'm an A Christian, and you're not going to get to heaven because you're an F Christian. You made an F, and I made an A. The Bible says that as long as our faith is in what Christ did on that cross, we're both going to go to heaven. But you've got to understand that the baptism of the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you get more of the Spirit of God. It means you give more of yourself to the Spirit of God. Why? Because you're influenced by the Spirit of God. You're influenced by that. And now that, that desire that you had to do this over here for the Lord, now it is even greater than it was before. Well, I'm doing this for the Lord over here, and, 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 you know, that's a good thing. Yes, it is. But now that you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, now you want to do even more of that. Well, what about this back over here again? Well, yes, now you want to, be, you want to do that even more than what you did. Whatever it is you're doing for the Lord, all it's going to do is going to enhance what you're doing. It's going to enhance your relationship because you're giving more of yourself to the Lord. How are you doing that? By being filled with the Spirit of God. And we talked last week, and I don't want to re-preach last week's sermon. We talked about it last week. A lot of times, we don't know if we want that or not. We don't know if we want the Lord to search the innermost parts of our heart and have us to stop doing whatever. And that will prevent you from being baptized in the Holy Spirit. There has to be an absolute surrender. All right, I'm getting further and further behind here. You see, God made us to be influenced by his spirit. That's, that's one of the greatest ways that he can operate here on this earth. Jesus told the disciples, he said, I go away that the Father may send you another a comforter. The word comforter there means another of the same kind. He said, I've got to go away so the Father can send the Holy Spirit in the form uh, of the Spirit of God to indwell you. And now Christ lives in me and in this one and 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 this one. He's operating now not through the flesh and the body of Christ in the sense of who Jesus of Nazareth was, but Jesus of Nazareth is now operating through Nicole, operating through brother and sister Adcock, operating through believers, doing the Father's will. So it is the Father's will that you be influenced by the Spirit of God to do everything that he would have you to do is for his purpose. It's for his purpose that you're to be influenced so that he can operate through you, through his love can be exemplified through you. See, you can't do this on your own. You can't do this if you're in darkness. Why can't you do it in darkness? Because you can't see where you're going. You've not been illuminated to the truth yet. And so when you have come into the light, when you do that, then God wants to, to, to use you and he wants to influence you to do whatever he wants you to do. That way you can be more effective in your testimony, in your gifts, in your prayer life, in your witnessing, and whatever it is that you're doing, you're being influenced by God to do those things. You know why we have wars and rumors of wars? You know why we have uh, 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 bad things happening to good people? Because everybody is not in the light. Everybody is not 
uh, uh, being influenced by the Spirit of God. There are many spirits in this world, but there's only one Holy Spirit. And if you're in darkness... Now, you may be the best guy that ever walked the face of the earth, best lady that ever walked the face of the earth. But if you're not saved, you're being influenced by demonic spirits. Oh, I don't do anything demonic. The devil doesn't necessarily have to have everybody run around murdering people. Well, some people, he's satisfied for you to just be in ignorance. If you're in darkness and you don't even know it, that suits the devil just fine. He's okay with that. You can be, a, you can be, you can be the upstanding citizen. You, you can be as popular as Lady Gaga. Have a billion hits on your latest song. He's cool with that. Why? Because you're not being influenced by the Holy Spirit of God. You're being influenced by spirits other than the Holy Spirit, which means if it's not the Holy Spirit, then it can only be a spirit of the enemy. And it may be as something as, as casual as your indifference to God. And that's where the majority of the world is at today. We were coming to church this morning and Guy pulled out in front of him, you know, and he had his four-wheeler and his little dirt bike on his truck. And you know, it's pretty obvious he's headed somewhere to go dirt biking today. Is, is being on a dirt bike a sin? Riding a four-wheeler a sin? I don't think so. But he gave no thought to the fact that this was Sunday morning. He had no priority. I don't know if he had kids or not, but if he had kids, he had no priority to, hey, my kids need to be in the house of God on Sunday morning. Now, that in itself would not make him a Christian, don't get me wrong. But I'm showing you how he's under the influence of a different kind of spirit. Not The Holy Spirit didn't tell him go four-wheeling today. So what, what influenced him to do that? Well, maybe it was just his own idea. No, no, no. At the very least, the influence of the Spirit of God to have indifference to the things of God influenced him to some level. Are you getting what I'm saying? He may be a very good guy. I have no clue about him. I don't know who he is. I don't know nothing about him. But he has, at the very least, an indifference to the house of the Lord. He may even, as so many people do, he may even claim, well, I'm a Christian not having a clue what that means. But he's influenced by an indifference to the need to be in the house of God. That influence didn't come from the Holy Spirit. Well, maybe his brother influenced that. Maybe. But even if his brother did, still there's forces working there to give him an indifference to the things of God. That's why the majority of the world is lost today. That's why they're in darkness. Because they have a total indifference. That's one of the greatest sins that is out there today. There's an indifference to the things of God. Oh, you just think they don't go to your church, they're going to go to hell. That's not what I'm saying. I'm going to put words in my mouth. But if they have an indifference, if, if, if God is not a priority, if it's not a priority in your life, then you're being influenced by a demonic spirit. I don't care if you're saved or not. If he's not a priority in your life, more important than your four-wheeler, more important than sleeping in, more important than going and doing something else, Fathers, it's your responsibility to see to it that your family is in the house of God, to be influenced by the Spirit of God. If, if you yourself are not saved, then you need to be exposing them to the Spirit of God so they can at least have a little influence. And you're going to be held accountable for that someday. When you stand before God to be judged, 
He's going to say, I gave you a wife and half a dozen kids or whatever you got. What did you do with that? Well, I took them to the lake on Sunday and spent time with them. Influenced. There's an influence that the Spirit of God wants to do in you. When I got saved, the Spirit of God began to reside within me, and I began to change my way of thinking, talking, acting. Uh, a lot about me changed. When I got baptized with the Holy Spirit, that escalated to another level. And I began to, to really and truly want God's will in my life. I began to, to, to desire the things of God even more than I had before. That Because as I would come to the house of the Lord, you know, I'm always talking about the big three. Praying, reading the Word, and being in the house of God. If you'll do those three things, you'll stay strong in God. If you neglect one of those three things, you're going, you're going to struggle as a result of it. Because the Spirit of God is involved in all three. As you pray, the Spirit of God is most assuredly involved. As you read the Word, the Spirit of God is expounding upon the Word, explaining it to your heart and showing you things in the Word of God that you didn't know. As you go to the house of the Lord, you're exposed by the influence of those around you and those who are of like faith. You're exposed by the preaching of the Word of God. You're exposed and influenced by the singing of the, uh, and the hymns of the Word of God. All of these things do what? They influence you which helps you to stay strong. Now that in itself, you can do all three of those things and never get saved and still go to hell. But I'll assure you, if you'll do those three things, you're going to draw an eye unto God as you never have before. You're going to want more of him than you've ever had. And it's going to keep you strong in the Lord. If, if, if you're a Christian and you've been saved for any length of time and your fire is gone then you've neglected one of those three. Guarantee it. You, either, you, know, you may do all those three, but you're not doing them as you once were. You know, a lot of us can't get enough of this word when we first get saved. Then after we get saved, oh, I, I've read that. We'll quit reading the word, or we quit reading it recursively. I can't say that word aggressively as we did right at first and the end result is that that our fire begins to kind of dwindle a little bit doesn't mean we lost and going to hell doesn't mean we lost our salvation we're just not we're not influencing ourselves as we once did Peter said in Acts chapter 2, he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said, this promise is to you and to your children, as many as the Lord shall call. That means that it's for any believer, any person that's been saved, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for you. Some people say, it's not for me. Oh, yes, it is. Peter said it was in Acts chapter 2. It awakens the consciousness of God within you. Before you got saved, you had no consciousness of God. That, your spirit was, you were dead in your sins. The Bible says that the spirit of God quickeneth. That means to bring life to. And that's what's taking place. I, I just want to go through some things real quick here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Sometimes we call people forward for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and sometimes we get takers, and sometimes we don't. Last week, I just knew there would be people that would come forward for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and, and, and there were several came forward to be refilled, but no one came forward for the first time, or no one came forward that had not been baptized in the Holy Spirit to receive. I think that a lot of times that happens out of, like I say, I think one of the bigger deterrents is, is, is false teaching that we may have been under at one point in time in our life. Another is that we really don't understand how to worship. If you'll read the book of Acts, 
you'll see when people were baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Bible indicates that they were worshiping God. And I talked a little bit last week about the fact that we come forward sometimes for the wrong reason. What is our motive? I mean, do we want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost because our wife is, because our husband is, because our cousin is, because everybody in church is and we're not? Or do we want it for the proper reasons? And I think that's very important. But until we learn how to worship God, we can't get past, you know, if we have wrong teaching in our head, the only way to overcome that wrong teaching is by worship. You come forward, you just worship God. You come forward, God, I'm here, you give me whatever I, I need, whatever that might be. I come forward, I'm worshiping you. You know, if I get filled, that's great. If I don't, well, I'll get it next time. We come forward sometimes, we, we, we try to make it happen. I can't make it happen for you. You can't make it happen for you. The only thing you can do is come and surrender and say, Lord, I'm here. Everything's yours, holding nothing back. If I've got things I am holding back, deal with my heart about that right now and then begin to just I tell people all the time, I said, just start worshiping God. And, and we had, we, when, we, when Brother Gable was here, we had 30, 40 people lined up up here for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I told every one of them, saying that. I said, start worshiping God. I'll be back in a minute. And I'd come back, and some of them would just be standing there. They might have their hands up, and they might be silently praying. I don't know what they were doing. But were they really worshiping God? And the ones who, who came forward, and, and, and you could tell that their heart was surrendered, you could tell they were ready. I didn't have to tell them to worship God. They were already worshiping Him. He's going to come. He's going to fill you with the baptism of the Holy Spirit as you worship him. He's going to do it. And you don't go down doubting, doubting it. You don't go down denying that it even uh, uh, exists. Wonder if it's God. I've had, I've had, them, had people start speaking in another language. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit by the evidence of speaking in another tongue. That's an evidence. I believe that that is done so that you yourself will know. It's not for me to know. It's for you to know. And, and, and through the years, I had struggled with that, but I, I truly believe that's the issue there, is that it's for you to know. There will be no doubt in your mind if you start speaking. And I've had people start speaking with other tongues and stop. And I tell them, don't stop. Well, it's not... I'm, I'm afraid that's not God. The Bible's very clear on that. That if you come and ask him for that, he's not going to give you something else. He's not going to deny you based on just denying you for the sake of not letting you have what he, someone else has. He's not going to ask for a fish and he give you a stone. You come forward, ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you start... You start yielding to whatever the Spirit of God is doing in your natural language, and he'll take the supernatural and begin to bring that supernatural. Sometimes we try to think these things out. Well, let me think of what I'm going to say before I do it. You don't think nothing. The only thing you do is you put your faith in the fact that he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And as you're worshiping him, it'll happen. The Spirit of God will begin to move upon you. You're not going to say, okay, say this. Some people think when they come forward to the baptism of the Holy Spirit that, that God's going to take over their tongue and they're going to start saying what God makes them say. That's not going to happen. You're the one being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you have to speak it by faith. Well, I don't know what to say. You don't have to know what to say. Just speak what's there. God will feel, as you begin to speak, God will begin to to feel that. As you begin to worship God, you begin to worship Him. And oftentimes in the process of just worshiping God, under the influence of the moving and operating of the Spirit of God, suddenly they begin to speak with another language. A language that they don't understand. It's of God. If you're down here for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the devil's not going to be able to come in here and do something in you. 
And I know people teach that. I know people teach that, boy, you better be careful. You're, you're opening yourself up to demonic possession. Not going to happen. Number one, if you're a believer, demon can't possess you anyway. And so when you're sitting there and you're asking God to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, don't deny the existence of it. Just yield to it. Allow him to come. The Spirit of God is going to come where he's wanted. Uh, uh, Ephesians uh, uh, 4 and 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You've got to want it. You've got to accept it. He's going to come where he's welcome. But again, God's not going to force his Spirit on you. He's not going to do that. Maybe with the laying on of hands, normally here we'll, we'll try to do what Scripture says. We'll bring everybody forward there praising and worshiping God, and I'll, I'll tell them I'm going to come back later on. I'm going to lay hands on you, and when I do, the Spirit of God's going to fall on you. And, and, and most every time we've ever done that, before I get back to some of them, they're already speaking in tongues. You don't have to have my hands laid on you. That is scriptural to do that. It might come to you, you know, I, I had a friend that was in jail and, and was struggling with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I made a statement to him one time. I said, I'm going to pray. I said, and one of his problems was, was that he doubted. That was his biggest problem, was just doubt. I said, your problem is you think too much about it. You try to think this out logically how it's going to take place. And I said, that brings doubt because you're thinking in the natural. You're not thinking in the supernatural. I said, what God needs to do with you is he needs to wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and just baptize you with the Holy Spirit before you have time to talk yourself out of it. And I kind of laughed and went on about my way. Well, I come back to see him in jail. The next time I went to see him, uh, he told me, he said, you're not going to believe what happened. I said, what's that? He said, I was laying in bed the other night about 3 o'clock in the morning, and he said, all of a sudden I woke up speaking in tongues. He said, I woke up the whole pod. So they're throwing stuff at me and everything else, trying to get me to shut up. He said, I didn't care. He said, I finally had it. And he didn't remember me having told him that. I even said 3 o'clock in the morning. But the Spirit of God moved on him and baptized him in the Holy Spirit. If your desire is there, you will receive. That's what you need to understand. If you have a desire for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the only one that can keep that from happening is you. You're the only one that can give up. Because the Spirit of God is there. There's, there's... There may be some reason why you haven't been. You need to be praying and, and asking God to show you what that is. Uh, and I, I've probably already mentioned uh, those uh, as we have talked here. Remember, it's a matter of faith. Again, he's not going to, you know, you don't have to strain. You don't have to be fearful. I, I've had people come down and just beg God, oh, please, 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 please. Yeah. And that's okay to, to be sincere in asking God, but, you know, you don't have to beg him. It's Luke, uh, chapter 11. I was trying to remember where that verse of Scripture was. Chapter 11 says, If we know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give us the Holy Spirit that we ask for of him? When you go down, expect. Expect for the Spirit of God to baptize the Holy Spirit. If you're not expecting it, if you're not expecting it, then there's, the faith is not operating there. If you go down doubting it, what is that? That's doubt and faith don't, don't hardly verbalize in the same statement. And when that language, when you begin to praise and worship the Lord and that language begins to tell you, you just begin to speak it out. That natural language will sooner or later yield to what the Spirit of God wants to do in your language. Don't allow the, the natural to drown out the supernatural. And once it starts, let it flow. Candace, if y'all come, we'll close. Don't cut the Spirit of God off. Don't cut him short in what he wants to do. Revel in it. Accept it. Receive it. Let it flow in you. Is anybody here this morning, I, I felt led early in this message to talk about salvation. When the Spirit of God deals with me about that, I usually know there's someone in the audience 
that has a salvation issue, you're not saved, just to put it bluntly. You're a good person. Again, it's not saying that you're not a good person. But the reality of the situation is that you've yet to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If that's you this morning, I want you to come down here and let me pray a simple prayer with you. There's no reason to leave here today unsaved. There's no reason for you to not have light in the darkness that you've been living in. I search every Sunday. I, I, I seek from God. I said, Lord, give me the words to speak. I don't know what, I don't know how to reach an individual. I, I, this is Josiah, and I know him very well, and I know he loves the Lord, but if I didn't know him, I would have no idea how to reach Josiah. I wouldn't know what made him tick. I wouldn't know what he liked and what he disliked. I wouldn't know his personality. I wouldn't even know if he was saved or not. So I ask God every week, I say, Lord, give me the words. Give me, that, give me that one thing to say that will stick home with someone who's here who's not saved. I do that because I want you to see. I want you to understand where I once was. I was once there. But somehow, some way, the Lord drew me and called me in. I don't know that I've ever heard a human being say, I wished I hadn't got saved. But I know of hundreds, maybe thousands, who have walked out the door unsaved, unchanged by what I've had to say. That hurts me because I feel like I failed them in reaching them for Jesus Christ. Like when I do a funeral, I know some of those people, that's the only gospel, that's the only preaching they'll ever hear. And I want them to know that Jesus loves them. I want them to know that if they'll just give him some leeway in their life, if they'll just give their heart to him, he'll change their world. Is there anybody here this morning? You're not confident in your own spirit that you're saved. You can't say without a doubt, if I lay my head down tonight and die of a heart attack, that I'm going to end, wake up in heaven. If you can't say that, you need to come down here this morning. I'll assure you, you'll never regret the decision that you make. Anybody here? Every head bowed and every eye closed, please. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm not trying to get you to do anything other than everybody else in this church hasn't done at one time or another. If you don't have that confidence in your spirit this morning, if you're not convinced that you're on your way to heaven, you need to come down here tonight. Anybody here? Any person, any man, woman, child, you don't know Jesus. Not, not like I've been talking about it anyway. You thought you did, maybe. I'm not saying you're not a good person. It's not a per point of whether or not you're a good person. It's a point of whether or not your soul has been secured and sealed in heaven. If that's you this morning and you just can't quite bring yourself to come forward right now, but you'd like me to pray for you, just between you and me, just raise your hand up right quick and right back down. Thank you for that hand. Anybody else? I feel like there are others here this morning. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not, I'll never mention it to you unless you talk to me about it first. Anybody else? I feel like there are others here this morning. Lift your hand up right quick and right back down. Anybody here? Anybody? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the honesty of this one here this morning, Lord God. And I do, I pray that the eyes of their understanding would be opened, that you'd shine some light into their darkness, that you'd shine some light into their life, Lord God, and let them come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, Lord. Let them realize that no matter what it is that they're hanging to on in this world, that there's something better for them. That the, Whatever they have, whatever you have blessed them with, is still theirs, Lord God, but that you want to give them something even better. And I pray you make that understanding to them today. In Jesus' name.